quick intro with me, and then I'd love to do some stuff with you. Uh, if I've done anything right, it won't be that I've taught you anything new. I try to reframe things. You've been doing yoga, obviously, with Lori and with other people. You've been moving with other people. So I just want to reframe and give you something, maybe different perspective on things. My name is Kenton Sepsik. I'm a registered acupuncturist. I have been in practice for 10 years. I have been also very active in the traditional Chinese martial arts for about 23 years. So when we get to the movement portion, we'll do some Qigong stuff, and that'll be kind of our movement that'll get us warm. We'll try and do some other things to maybe warm us up in this room as well. My history is I was 14 years old, and I was watching late night television in my parents' house, and this white-haired guy started beating up ninjas on a bridge. And I went upstairs the next morning, and I was like, Mom, you have to take me to this Kung Fu school. And she was like, no. She says, you quit piano, you quit soccer, you are no good at ice skating, there's no way I'm taking it, but I'm an only child, and I'm adopted. So it didn't take me very long. <laughs> a couple hours, right? Anyways, that Thursday night, I went to this Kung Fu class. And I will never forget, I'm like 14 years old, and there's, there's this girl, she's like 12, right? And she's got on a yellow belt. She's only got her first belt on. And she's trying to get me to do this movement. And I was the most awkward kid, and I couldn't do it at all. It was horrible. But here I am 23 years later, and I'm glad I stuck with it. And through my martial arts, who remembers Bruce Lee? Does anybody remember Bruce Lee? Yeah. Okay, cool, awesome, okay, good. Everybody's kind of my age, right? I'm trying to connect right off the bat. So, so Bruce Lee taught a, a, a gentleman by the name of Jesse Glover, and Jesse Glover taught a gentleman by the name of Suki Goes Out, and Suki Goes Out taught me. So I do have some lineage through Bruce Lee, if you will, of uh, some martial arts stuff. And Jesse Glover and Suki Goes Out's big stuff was take the stuff, the knowledge, and make it yours. And make acronyms for it, and, and reframe it, and make it into your own language, create your own language. Acronyms seem to work really well for me. I work in traditional Chinese medicine. Everything is TCM and you know all these different things. And you're talking about patients, HBP and all these things, right? So I came up with my own acronym that I run through my head on a continual basis throughout my day. And I'm just gonna give it to you, and then we're gonna do some of this stuff. So the first one is breathing. Who here knows what yoga means? What's the true meaning of the word yoga? What does that mean? Union. Union. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yoga instructor. She knows. She knows. You gotta stay with her. She doesn't suck. <laughs> so it means union. But we can stretch this. We can say union with what? Union with the great spirit. Union with self. Also union with breath. So when I think about yoga, like right off the get, I think about somebody in some crazy pose that I can't do. It's like the first thing I think about. And that's due to our culture, right? We've got this exterior version or external version or visual version when that could be further from the truth. So breathing for me is what connects me to myself. And I use breathing to break patterns. We're gonna get into this. The next thing I run through my head during the day is, do I have good posture for what I'm doing? Do I have good posture right now for what I'm standing in front of you? Do I have good posture when I'm sitting? When I bend over to pick something up, do I have good posture to pick that thing up? So posture is a big thing. And when we get into the Qigong movement, we're going to discuss posture again because we use what's considered Tai Chi posture. And last but not least is the actual movement. The fact that you have yoga in your life is amazing. And maybe you have other movement practices. And that's all that my martial arts has turned itself into. Yeah, for sure it's fun to put on some gloves and a mouth guard and punch each other in the face. Or maybe get choked out or something like this. It's fun. Uh, to have an adversary in front of you, you know, making you become better. That's why we have instructors and coaches and that sort of thing. But for me, movement is becoming like almost like a moving meditation. And again, we'll get into that when we do our Qigong. What I mean by that. Does that make sense? 
So this is what I kind of want to get through today. So let's start with this breathing. And for sure, there's things that you've done in the past with other people. Uh, and just kind of have an open mind. My number one rule is if I ever ask you to do something and you don't feel comfortable doing it, or you get into it and you don't like it, you stop and you make it yours. Okay? So I don't want to ever force anything upon you. We're gonna do a one, one or two couple tricky things today. Uh, but the first thing I want you to do is lay down on your mat. So as you lay down on your mat, I'm just gonna to talk to you. There you go. Just ate supper, right? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Cheesecake. <laughs> and yes, and cheesecake. So healthy cheesecake. Healthy cheesecake. When we talk about taking a deep breath in, if you were to just take it, I, I just want you to do this right now. Just take a deep breath in, right from where you are. And there's not very much air that you can get. Okay, I'm relaxed. So you can't get very much air. Go ahead and put your hands on your tummy just below your belly button. And I kind of have a rule, a general rule. The key to a good inhale is a good exhale. So what I want you to do is I want you to feel your stomach and diaphragm moving. So go ahead and breathe out as much air as you can and I actually want you to push your belly in, like suck it in as you go. So you should be out of air now. Take a deep breath in. Good, and relax. So you should notice automatically that just by collapsing your stomach, you'll get deeper breaths. And we wanna take this to the full extent as we can. So go ahead and breathe all the way out, sucking your stomach in as far as it'll go. Breathe in, out, good, on your own time, in, and out, good, and I'm just looking around the room here, keep going, so see if you can express the full potential of your diaphragm and abdomen, so when you take a deep breath in, I want your stomach to look like it had cheesecake. And then I want, right? And then I want, when you're done, I want it to look like it's empty, like you've been on a 12 hour fast. There we go. We got our bellies moving. Good, three more, and then if you'd be so kind as to sit up and face me. Excellent. The reason why I typically like to start, oops, here so everybody can see me. I like to start with everyone laying down on the floor is because gravity will help you. Gravity will help you pull your abdomen down and we'll pull it up. Now we're gonna do something a little bit more challenging. We're gonna sit, you can sit cross-legged or however you find yourself comfortable. You're going to stick your thumb inside your belly button and put your hand just below. And we're going to do this sitting now. So you're going to breathe out first. In. perspective as well, because you're massaging your internal organs. You're massaging your small intestine, your large intestine, even your ribs, your gallbladder, your spleen to some extent. And it's really, really good to do this throughout the day. And what you can sometimes do is have a little fun with it where you breathe in, and you breathe out, and you wave it up. So you can start to control your own diaphragm because it's its own muscle and it deserves a little bit of love. 
just like your Kegels and all these other things that we generally don't practice a lot of. So let's try something a little bit trickier now. We're going to do the same type of breathing, except we're going to do it quite, quite forcefully. And just let me demonstrate what this is going to look like. So we're going to go in, out. See if you can try to do that again. You get dizzy, go back to normal breathing, but just give it a shot. Let's try 30 breaths and maybe try and stay in tune with me just for fun. Again, you break away from me, do your own thing, just kind of trying to challenge you today. So, we're going to go out in. just normal So in yoga, you might have experienced that. It's a version of what we're going to do next called Kapabhati breathing, meaning shining skull. So as you were doing it, you very well could have felt that the fact that your nostrils or maybe even your sinuses felt like they were lit up, like they were glowing, and that's because of all that over-oxygenated you know, air coming into your, into your brain. So the reason why I talk about breaking patterns is because a lot of times when we get stressed, we stress breathe. We breathe with that top portion of our lungs. And that's where I generally ask somebody to say, hey, take a deep breath in, and they go, and then they kind of max out, oh, you stress breathe. So one thing we need to recognize is throughout our day is how are we breathing? Are we belly breathing or abdominal breathing with our diaphragm throughout our entire day? because then that means that we are more grounded, we're away from the stress. And what can happen is everything kind of starts to build up. We have zones in Chinese medicine and acupuncture land where pe people get sore when they are full of stress. One of these areas, of course, is the neck and shoulder area. Uh, some people kind of call it the coat hanger, right? Uh, the other area of concern is actually the abdomen. So then this can affect digestion and bowels and maybe even turn into like interstitial cystitis or some sort of bladder irritation. We find in Chinese medicine that people who are stressed, they sigh a lot. They go, <sighs> and it's because this area is responsible for moving all, kind of regulating all the flow of energy throughout the body. And so when we do this, we're shaking our rib cage, trying to shake this up. So that's kind of those things that we want to be aware of. And I find that even personally, I can get and break these patterns with abdominal breathing. The same thing is true. You saw me trying to warm up when I first kind of came in, and I was going. So if I need to get pumped up, I've got my hip hop right before I come here, right? I've got my 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 UK grime, whatever it is. I've got it blasting in my hotel room, trying not to tick off the neighbors and I'm breathing, and I'm pacing, and I'm, and I'm getting myself pumped up. So we can use breathing to break patterns. So if you find yourself needing to chill out, you use your breath to chill you out. If you find you need to get psyched up, you use your breath to kind of get you psyched up. So now I want to actually do an actual couple of breathing exercise. And I'll explain it, I'll kill the video because I'm going to need the timer for it. But basically, it's the same thing that we were doing, except we're going to do small breaths. And you almost want to be kind of down about three quarters of air. So you don't want to be up in air like this, doing it. You want to be almost out of air. And you're just going to puff little breaths of air out. Tick, 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 about that fast. And you want to see if you can use your abdomen to do this. If you are not accustomed to using your abdomen a lot, it might be a little bit difficult. The other thing I want to talk about is what you feel when you're kind of finished all this, more on a physical level as well. So we're going to do this for 10 minutes. And when I'm doing this for my, on my, by myself, I do it for 20. So then you can do it for 30, and you can get completely lost in it for an hour if you want. So it kind of looks like this. When I 
feel like I might be running out of air, I actually go to that more deeper breathing. So if you find yourself running out of air and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm just gonna make it, right? <laughs> then you can go with something like this. And you can return yourself to the breathing with everyone else on your own time. For whom was that the first time that they did that? Awesome. Did anybody feel anything physically? I felt dizzy. I felt dizzy. <laughs> totally fair. The more you do it, the less did, the less did you get. It's hard to keep the sustain. Like, at the rush, like, almost I didn't know how to breathe. I had to stop myself and restart over because everything was uncoordinated. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, that was very good. Yes, the first time I tried this breathing was I felt like, oh my gosh, felt like I was a breathing for the first time. Yeah. Because yeah, again, it kept, kept breaking pattern. Something that I find very interesting is that my back muscles get really sore. Yeah. Right here. Is anybody kind of feeling like, oh my gosh, I've never worked that area out before? What's kind of interesting in Chinese medicine, we say that the kidneys grasp the chi that the lungs breathe. So, and, and if so, if I have a patient that is having problems getting a breath in, maybe they're having asthma problems, emphysema, COPD, whatever, it doesn't matter. I want to treat the kidneys. And you wouldn't believe where the kidneys reside. It's around L2. And there's that acupuncture point for the kidney energy. So I think they kind of knew what they were talking about. Maybe they were saying, oh, the kidneys are going to grasp the chi, but there's a physical part to that where tendon and muscle attachments are working with your diaphragm. So that's excellent. So you've got two amazing tools. You have them, they go wherever you go. You've got breathing in a relaxed manner, and you have kind of like a couple of breathing where you, you, can, you can really stimulate yourself. You can also look at it as a meditation. I look at my 10 minute or 20 minute breathing sessions as a meditation, and I also look at my Qigong, Tai Chi, uh, Kung Fu, whatever, it doesn't matter, as a meditation as well. So the next thing I wanna talk about is posture. So everybody, including me, I'm sure is cold because the AC is on, so we're gonna get you to stand up. Kung Fu posture is really interesting to me. Has anybody ever been on a horse? Yes. Yeah, yeah look at you. Lots of you have been on a horse, this is fantastic. All right, so in Kung Fu, we have what's called the riding horse stance. And you kind of put your feet just a little bit bigger than shoulder width, toes are pointing outward, and you sit down like you're riding a horse. Now, you'll probably see at some of these other martial arts schools, they'll be down like this, this is no good, it's not good for your knees. And nobody rides a horse like that either. So your head is in line with your shoulder, and your shoulder is in line with your hip, and your hip is in line with your ankle. And that's how you're supposed to be when you're in the stirrups. And this is where you are riding a horse. You walk your feet in a little bit. Your knees are still soft, and this is posting trot. So for those of you who are not aware, when you're on a horse and it starts to trot, you start getting jostled, and it doesn't feel very good. Plus it's not very good on a horse's back. So typically what you're doing in the stirrups is you stand up on the diagonal with the leg and you stand up and you come up on your toes, but you still have to be well postured and you still have to have your toes up and your heels down because if that horse trips, you're going ass over tea kettle. So this is, these, these are the two basic postures that are used in Kung Fu and we're going to use them today. What I'd like you to do is pretend that right about where your hair whirl is, or a little bit in front of it, I want you to picture somebody picking that up. But what automatically happens is your chin goes in. So somebody picks you up by that area. At the same time, I want you to take your tailbone and tuck it, not in, but I want you to push your tailbone down. So now you've elongated your spine. This is something that you should do throughout your day, sitting in a car.
car standing waiting for somebody. You should work on elongating your spine because it's always in a crampy, compressed position. Elongating your spine is really, really important. Let's try something else. So in yoga, we have this wonderful pose. What do you guys call this? Cobra, Sphinx, something along these lines, right? So you've got this wonderful pose. So come down with me in this wonderful pose. And push yourself up into the pose. This pose scares the hell out of me, okay? This scares the hell out of me because what can typically happen, just relax for a second, maybe go back into your knees. For the most part, if we just lift up, your spine, go, which has a disc in between it, goes like this. And that, that scares me. So let's try something different. So go ahead and be, go, put yourself in a push-up position almost. Now I want you to pull the crown of your head up. I want you to push your tailbone down a bit, and now I want you to push your feet away from you. Now with your hands, drag yourself forward, and you're gonna move forward a little bit because your skin's gonna move underneath this mat. And now I want you to come up, and I want you to keep almost like you're gonna pull yourself right out of this. Good. Excellent. Good, relax. Just come up maybe on your knees. The same thing should be held true for your neck. So if I'm gonna look up, and I'm gonna do this very carefully, you never want to look up like this. Again, we've got a kink. It's almost like, you know, if you've got a spring, and if you kink that spring, you can't get it back the way it was. So same thing, when you look up, you want to stretch up, and now you look up. And you should almost feel it in your throat. So try that, look up, and it's almost like you can feel your throat stretching. Go ahead and relax. So this all has to do with really, really good posture and elongation. So when we do our Qigong, Tai Chi, Yoga, doesn't matter, I highly recommend that you elongate before you do anything. I even elongate when I'm like squatting or deadlifting or doing any type of like weightlifting exercises. Because if I'm down here, and let's say it's, if you, even if it's a goblet squat, and I just kind of come up like this, I might be putting pressure in places where I shouldn't be. So if I'm here and now I elongate, your, your whole body is designed to realign your hips underneath your head. That's why we slip and fall. The hips go up from underneath the head, and then your hands scramble to get you back up. So everybody stand up one more time. That's great. So those are my examples of really, really good posture and why we need excellent posture throughout our daily life, of course, and through all our activities that we're doing. So let's get into the movement portion. This is where I think we put it all together. We put the breathing and the movement all together. Today I want to teach you the eight brocade, which is a Qigong set. Some of you might be aware of it, and some of you not. Uh, everybody's got a little bit of a different variation on the set. It's Chinese Kung Fu for Pete's sakes. It's been around for 5,000 years, and somebody passed it down to somebody, and somebody passed it down to that person, that person, and it's like a telephone game, right? The thing I end up with is not maybe what somebody else ended up with. So if you want, you can take your little island and you can turn it 90. This is going to be fun. I'm going to watch everybody scramble for space. I once went to a, a yoga class in, in Calgary, because I'm born and raised in Calgary. And uh, I didn't get there with enough time. And like, man, I got the dirtiest looks. Like, I was trying to squeeze my mat into other you know, people's mats, and man, they were just like, like snobs. Here's the horrible. Glad none of you are like that. This is great. All right. So the first thing we want to do before we do any Qigong or Tai Chi is we want to do breathing. So BPM is there for a reason. So you just want to start your belly breathing. We're not doing any forceful breathing. We're not doing any kababashi breathing right now. We're just relaxing into our breath, so. So you get your kind of your breathing cycle going. 
So you worry about the breathing and I'll keep chatting. The next thing we want to do while you're working on your breathing is you want to work on your posture. So your crown goes up, which automatically tucks your chin in. I'm going to take my tailbone and tuck it back and down. I'm going to have nice soft knees. I'm not going to have my knees locked out. We're going to do one more thing. You're going to take your shoulder blade and you're going to pull your shoulder blade back and down. This is a huge difference between somebody telling you, I remember when I was a little kid, my parents used to say, stand up straight, pull your shoulders back, and you go like this, and you puff your chest out. The other problem with this is that I end up pinching my shoulder blades back together, and this is something we don't want to do. Kung Fu generates power, typically by standing in front of the person with your hips squirt. Can I hold you? We're gonna pick on more abs. Try to pick five. <laughs> okay. So how this works is that if Lori tries to push me with a hand like this, right, and I push, she can't hold the pressure, right. But what ends up happening if you take your shoulder blade, lock it back and down. Good. Take your elbow, put it down. Good. Watch this. Just ready if you don't know this, make it. No, 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 not like this. Okay, square. Yeah, good. Okay. Ready? Up down. Good. This is locked back. Now watch this. The only thing that's collapsing is your arm. Our whole body's not going, right? Now push from your hip. And I'm gone. Cool. Thank you. So what's really cool about this is not only can we generate power and hit people in the face really hard, because that's come before you. But we can use this on a day-to-day -day basis. I do not open a door using my arm. I've been brainwashed for way too long to grab a door and pull it like this, or to grab a door and push it like this. Especially those big, heavy doors that have maybe like a handicap button or something like that on it, which most of them do these days, or a bank door. They're heavy, steel. So what we want to do is we can use this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm always looking for an excuse to use my Kung Fu in the real world, because I'm not a monk. I can't you know, train eight hours a day and all this kind of stuff and sleep in the monastery. So when I'm gonna open and close doors, I'm gonna use my Tai Chi posture to do it. Right? Elbow down, heavy, shoulder blades back and down. Okay? So that's a good excuse to try this stuff. So again, you've got your breathing cycle going, crowns up, tailbone down, Shoulder blades back and down, knees are soft. And that's how you get to count. So that would be considered like the perfect Tai Chi posture. Let's try one more thing. We're going to do standing posts. So go ahead and picture like you're holding a tree. Right in front of you. Good. The biggest thing I want you to do right now is actually have your elbows pointing towards the ground. So automatically when we think we're gonna grab something, we kind of go like this. The shoulders come up and the elbows point outward. But again, we want shoulder blades back and down and we want elbows down as well. Perfect. So this is called standing pose. This is a beginner Qigong exercise that they teach you and say, okay, stand here for a very long time and do your belly breathing. Well, there's going to be a lot of postures that we're gonna to do today and we're going to kind of rely on this kind of I say it's almost like you're holding your Buddha belly. And we want to come to this position where we're nice and relaxed. Perfect. Let's do our warm up for our Qigong. Go ahead and pretend you're holding a little bird inside your hand and you're just going to basically twist and I want you to tap your lower abdomen gently. Also your low back. You've got good posture in your breathing, right? While you're doing this. This area below the navel and also on the low back is considered where your dantian or your field elixir is. It's where your core root water and root fire processes are present. So that's why we're warming it up and we're telling you, hey, get ready, we're about to. Okay, and right. The first posture is called two hands holding the sky. We're just going to do the motion first and then we're going to add in the breath. 
So we just went through standing pose. So we want to round out our big Buddha belly. Everybody do this with me. Come to about shoulder height, and I want you to push everything you ate down. Good. Then we're going to straighten out. You want to look at the backs of your hands, and then down. Good. One other thing we want to do, we're going to do it again. You want to watch your hands without moving your hands. Round out your big Buddha belly, press down. Good, watch your hands. And use your peripheral vision to watch your hands. Good, breathe in. Breathe out. In. your hands where you can see them so they'll be away from the body a little bit in and make sure you can still see your hands as you bring them up. Good and relax. That's the first posture. One note about watching your hands. Typically in Qigong and Tai Chi we're watching our hands. Why we do this is because we want to bring awareness to the present moment. I don't know if it's happened to you but it's happened to me many times. Usually I'm in a hurry and I reach for a pen, and then I go to look at you, and I knock over a glass of water on the way through. And it's because I didn't reach for the pen, grab the pen, and then return to what I was doing. So you're gonna find that in the Qigong, we're gonna move quite slowly. We're gonna go with something like this, grabbing the glass of water, bringing it over here, drinking the glass of water, and putting it back, and then going on to the next thing. So Qigong is teaching us to be present in the moment by watching our hands. And because our hands are connecting our, our mind, body, and spirit to this external world. Right? You've got your little earth space suit that you're wearing for an undetermined amount of time, and you're interacting with the world. So we want to do it on a very careful and slow basis. Even when you do it fast, you still want to be present about doing it fast. Sound good? What can sometimes happen is people will say that their hands are starting to feel hot. And people would say, oh, they have chi in their hands. We have a saying in Chinese medicine that wherever the mind goes, the chi goes. I translate chi a little bit differently. So people call it air, breath, energy, and that's fine. I like to translate it as potential because then that makes a little bit more sense. The character for chi is kind of like steam coming off of rice. So if you could see steam coming off of rice, and rice being very important to the Chinese people because it's their food staple, it's not quite air and it's not quite rice. It's like somewhere between the tangible and intangible. It's potential. It has the potential to become air, it has the potential to become rice. So backing up, Wherever the mind goes, the chi goes. Wherever your mind goes, your potential goes. Let's say I come over to your house and you're cooking me some chicken. And just after finishing some tea and dessert after, you say, oh my gosh, I, I think I undercooked the chicken. And maybe the chicken was fine, but I go home and I think about this chicken rolling in my stomach. And what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get sick. Or, you could say, oh my gosh, I think I undercooked the chicken, but you'll probably be okay. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. And the chicken was fine, and I'm fine. So wherever your mind goes, your body will follow 120%. So we have a huge connection with whatever you're thinking is gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I always say in the clinic, if it's you versus me, you win every time. And if I do, acup if I do acupuncture once a week for 10 weeks, I get you for one hour a week. You get you for the rest of the hours during the week. So you get to do whatever you want, right? So we have to manage that. So being in the present moment, being one with the breath, having good posture is a great way to take care of yourself. Here I am in my 10th year of practice. I went from 27 to 37. My patients went from 37 to 47 because some of them have stayed with me for the full 10 years. Some patients have gone from 47 to 57, 67 to 77. I have seen my patients get older. I have seen my patients say to me, 
oh, I just, my back hurts, my hip, it's just getting old. These sort of things. And I just so desperately want to say, no, it's not. You've just been going in the same direction for 10 years. And while I've been seeing this happen in the clinic, I've realized something else has been happening with me. I have consciously decided to go in the other direction. Because patients typically don't want to come see me and want me to blast them about their diet and their exercise and their lifestyle and all this kind of stuff. I'm the Mr. Fix-It guy. My back hurts, please put some needles in and fix it. I'm feeling down for the last three months. Can you fix it? That sort of stuff. So I'm kind of Mr. Fix-It. Kind of put a band-aid on it and send you back out in the world. And I'm going so far in the opposite direction that I'm sometimes, you know, probably considered a little bit weird. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, I don't gamble, I eat ridiculously clean. And as I'm going on this path and I continually see these patients again getting older and getting these chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and all these things that I'm, I, I'm like stripping even more from my lifestyle. So that's where this stuff comes from. This might be midpoint for you, this might be end point for you, this might be jump off for you. But I want you to look at this and I want you to look around you and I want you to look at what everybody's doing around you and I want you to pick and choose and decide to start doing the opposite. Something I've also discovered in clinic working with patients is that Let's say I have a patient and they have inflammation and they're full of phlegm all the time. And I say, hey, let's just try something. I want you to quit dairy for like six weeks. And maybe that's their thing. They quit dairy, cold turkey, and they come back and they see me in a couple of weeks and they say, oh my gosh, Kenton, I don't have any phlegm anymore. I'm like, that's great. Then I see them the next week for an acupuncture treatment. I say, how are you doing? They show me their tongue, because they do tongue diagnosis, and they have a sticky, yucky, yellow coating in your tongue. I say, oh my goodness, what's going on? Are you full of phlegm again? Yes, I'm full of phlegm. I had a little bit of dairy. I thought I was feeling so good, I just had a little bit. And something I've discovered in clinic is that every single time we make a good decision, it's plus 0.1. Every time we make a bad decision, we go in the opposite direction, it's negative 10. Our little spacesuit is almost like a little vat. And when we're young, we can eat Michelinas and Pizza Pops and do all sorts of crazy stuff. When we get smashed and wake up the next day and hair the dog, we get smashed again. Right? We can do it. We feel fantastic. Now, sleep is the new hangover. Right? I don't get enough sleep. I'm, I got a headache and I'm mad. This is stuff we need to think about. Plus 0.1 takes a long time to add up. And then you say, I haven't had that in a while. I think it'll be okay. Minus 10, and you're right back to where you started. So with that in mind, let's stand up and get back to where we were. Let's move our bodies again. So we did one, two, three, four. We'll do five, six, seven, eight. And then we'll string them all together, which is a lot of fun. So the first one, just quick review, we had two hands holding the sky, then we had pulling the bow, we stood up again, we had breaking the branch, and we had the wise owl gazes backwards. This next one can be challenging, but it's my favorite one, and it's called the snake. And this is how it works. You go up to that riding horse stance again. I like to put my hands on my knees with opposite grip. And you get to draw a figure eight with your nose. Now what it looks like is this. I go up, I draw a figure eight cutting through the middle, and I come up. And can you see me drawing a figure eight with my nose? Uh, yeah, you won't be able to see me do it. <laughs> I'll be too busy drawing my own figure eight. So I'm not looking at anybody else. This can be as gentle as you want, such as this. 
or as challenging as you want. All right. So the deeper you go, the more you're going to need to use your core like a snake. So if you just kind of stand up and just watch me do this, I'll do this a couple of times and then we'll do it together. Or you can try it. So what I'm going to do is I'm almost going to massage my abdomen with my thigh. That's how low I'm going to go. I'm going to massage my abdomen with my thigh and I'm going to push off my back foot. And now my hips are facing on a 45 this way. And I start to cream my neck over because I'm drawing that figure eight and I'm a snake. And then I start to shift. Once my head gets past the midline, my weight starts to shift. And now these feet and these hips, they need to move. So they're going to shift over and I'm going to push off this back. Depending on where so it goes like this, this way, and this way. Okay. And again, we don't have to go that deep. We can go here. push off that back foot. So a lot of coordination going on. So we're just going to try it. So let's try it without the breathing. And then I'll start calling up the breath and kind of add it in. So let's go up to your left first. So I want you to push off your right foot. And this would be like in a bow stance. And then you're going to cross through the middle. And then you're going to bring your head up. And you're going to push off your opposite foot. Excellent. What was I thinking? Bunch of yoga experts doing the snake. Because our dancing, but practice. Whatever it ended up being, I'm happy. Out to the middle. In as you're out. Out. In. Out as you're compressing, in as you expand and come up. Out. In. Man, I said that was the hardest one, and it just blew me away. Great. <laughs> Alright, so that's five. So that's the same. The next one is just kind of called Qigong Toe Touch. Again, remember, I'm super big on body mechanics and posture. So let me describe this one first because I want everybody to do it correctly. So feet will be about shoulder width apart. You're gonna reach up, and you're gonna to touch your toes. Please bend your knees so you can touch your toes. I want you to shift your hips back and away so that you can touch your toes. So I don't want any of this stuff, because now my back is doing all the work. I want my hips to do the work. See the difference? Back, hips. It's like I'm bending over to pick something up. So if we can do the Qigong correctly today, and when you go pick something up at your house tomorrow, you do it well. I'm a big believer in doing everything like it's a sport. Right? So we should vacuum. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Because what happens, right? What happens? We vacuum, I'm gonna get it under here, we're gonna get this, that sort of thing, and then you go, oh, that was really bad. Vacuum is really bad for me, right? So again, again, if we, good body posture, and when we're doing all these things, right? What I typically like to do, when I first learned this movement, it was literally like this. You breathe in, and you breathe out, and you breathe in, and you're like, oh my gosh, my head. So I hold for two on the way down. And just one more time. When you reach down, push your hips back. When you come back up, drive your hips forward like you, like, yeah, exactly. Like they're coming back up under you. So they get out of your way so you can do whatever you need to do. And now they need to get back up underneath you. Right? And that's, that's a deadlift. Right? Boom. Boom. And when you do it with good posture, because again, if I go like this, and then I go like this, that's a back tick. But again, if I go like this, and I elongate as I come up, now I'm stretching everything, right? Okay. 
Enough about those body mechanics, eh? So we're going to breathe in, we're going to reach up. Nice big stretch, but with good posture, which is tricky to do. And then out. Hinge your hips back, feet on your toes. Stay here. Breath in. Out. Good. Hips get underneath you. Stand up. In. Out. In. Out. I don't want to keep you away from your Wi Fi and your house of cards. <laughs> okay, two more. Yeah, sit by the fire. Yeah. <laughs> the next one is called punching with anger, and this is done for two reasons. We're in our riding horse stance, we're riding our horse right now, we're not posting truck. Go ahead and make a fist, and for those of you who haven't made a fist in a long time, Bring in your first set of knuckles, bring in your next set of knuckles, and your thumb goes over top. So your thumb never goes on the inside and it never goes on the side. It always goes over top. You're going to punch about navel height. So go ahead and put your left hand out. And your right hand is going to be pulled back here in what we call chamber. It's chambered back in. This is navel height because again, we want to keep our shoulder back and down. We want to keep our elbow down. We're using good body mechanics again, even though we're throwing punches in the air. The other thing that's quite interesting about this is that we're going to pull one back and we're going to push one forward. We're going to do it with what's called dynamic tension. So you're going to squeeze your fists as tight as you can and you're going to squeeze your forearms and your biceps and your shoulder and your back and you're going to exchange them in the middle. Ah, you see what's going on. And then you're finished and you release. So that's how we're going to do it. The other really cool thing about this, I don't know if you can see this, is watch what my forearm does to my side. This one massages as it goes through, and this one massages as it goes through. Remember we talked about sighing, liver, gallbladder, spleen, stomach, all that energy in here from a Chinese medicine point of view. Self-massage is a huge part of self-care in Chinese medicine. It's something that we recommend patients do, especially if they're feeling stressed and they have digestive problems. Right where your end of your 11th and 12th rib are, pretty much, we do these big circles. And the reason we're doing this is to promote that flow of chi and energy and potential to tell your Chinese liver, not your Western liver, it's Chinese liver, to be kind to your spleen and the stomach and all that kind of stuff. So we're doing the same thing. So we might be punching with anger, and you have to make your angry face with this one. This is where you get all your crap out. Right? You gotta make your angry face, you're making your angry face, your ugly cry, whatever you want to call it. And at the same time, we're doing this massage, and we've got dynamic tension. So there's a lot going on.